This is the Long Island Retro Gaming Podcast. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode four of the Long Island Retro Gaming Podcast. Joining me today is George of One Up Restorations. Uh, George is someone who I would call a literal wizard. I'm pretty sure that other people <laughs> have also called him that. Uh, he is, uh, to say he's skilled at understanding, modifying, and, uh, well, I was going to say modding, but modding and modifying is the same thing. Uh, <laughs> old systems is a severe understatement. He, uh, the things that he has done that I've seen him done uh, for the for the Long Island Retro Gaming Expo and for members of the community is absolutely out of this world. He's a quality dude. George, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. This is great. Uh, so I just gave you a little uh, a little intro, but why don't you <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so uh, I've been into video games for pretty much as long as I can remember. Um, and uh, I got into, you know, console repair and restoration and modding kind of recently. I'd say like within the last five or so years and then kind of publicly only about two or three. Uh, so for a long time, I was just doing this stuff uh, for myself. Um, so it, it kind of actually comes from my professional background, even though my professional gra- background has nothing to do with video games or modding or anything like that at all. Um, so so my, my background is in neuroscience and um as a result of the work I had to do, sometimes I have to kind of branch out into doing other stuff. And uh, and so that's kind of how I learned a little bit about how to solder, how to build circuit boards, because um, sometimes I'd have to just make something for work and there was no commercial option available. And so I just have to kind of figure it out. Um, and then at some point, I think all of this started, this craziness, um, <laughs> when I was helping my parents clean out their their basement. And um, in the process, I discovered my old Game Boy and I had one, you know, I had actually I had two. So I had one and, uh, and you know, I stupidly broke it when I was a little kid. And that one never got tossed. And then I had one which I never broke and kept forever. And so the one I found was the busted one. And I was like, well, I could just throw this away. But I was like, maybe I can, you know, do something with this thing. And so, you know, one thing led to another. And I, I didn't end up fixing it, but I ended up turning it into like a little portable Raspberry Pi gaming machine. And so that kind of just set me off uh, on on the journey I've been on and, and kind of gone from there. Well, uh, I guess that's why I've seen you have a lot of love for the Game Boys, so I guess that's kind of where it <laughs> kind of where it started from. Yeah, it definitely did. Yeah, that's kind of where it started. And yeah, and my first project was way too ambitious. Like, I mean, I, I hadn't at that time soldered in a couple years. And so it's like one of those things like riding a bike like you you know, you know, if you learn how to do it, you don't really forget it. But still, I was a bit rusty, and I was doing something that was way above my class at that point. <laughs> right. um, but I still pulled it off, and, and then I was like, well, you know, maybe I could start fixing some other stuff. And so I fixed a few things for some friends and for myself. And then I discovered the Facebook page, Long Island Retro uh, Facebook page, and started just showing stuff that I do, and it just kind of cascaded from there. Yeah. So George is also the... Uh... Uh, lead preservationist is that the, the title that's okay. right <laughs> george is the lead preservationist for the long island retro gaming expo and he uh in his i would say almost year uh with us he has collected a couple really really good stories uh including computer space which i want to get into a little later on because yeah, th- that's a story that gives me chills uh so i definitely <laughs> want to talk about that but let's absolutely let's start uh so I, I think that there's more, there's obviously we talk about modding systems and uh, video output and all that stuff. It's it's a lot more than we could talk about in one podcast episode. So let's kind of start at the beginning. Uh, let's start at, say, some of the older systems, the 70s, 80s systems. How, uh, now I'm going to ask some elementary questions, mostly because yeah. I don't understand a ton like sure. about how this all works. So, yeah. Uh, how did they all? Because I I remember like say my NES came with an RF adapter, right? And I kind of right. get how that works. It uh, goes over the coaxial wire. Uh, but I remember my cousin's Atari had that weird, uh, with the little like the, the little forks. clips, yeah, little forks, <laughs> right? And yeah. uh, and I don't even know offhand if the '70s systems had that stuff as well. So. Like, you know, starting in the 70s to, to early to mid 80s, how did a lot of these systems output 
uh, audio and video? Yeah, so they all, the, the, the earliest ones, like the 2600 or the Fairchild Channel F, or yeah, all the way up until, well, they, it lasted for quite a while. It would, would be RF. That was the kind of, you know, standard at the time. There was no such thing as, as composite video. And uh, televisions in the 70s, they transitioned into something called a solid state television, which is where instead of having things like vacuum tubes, um, you have transistors. Um, which in principle should uh, last a lot longer um, than the older TVs, which are the vacuum tube TVs. And so those TVs, they only had an RF output. So, so um, they, were, they were basically looking for a radio frequency and you'd ba basically broadcast the, the video and the audio on a single channel to those, com to those, to those displays. Um, at some point, I think in the late 70s, I think, yeah, it was in the late 70s, but it was still prohibitively expensive. Composite video started becoming an option on higher end sets. And this was basically where you would separate the audio and the, and the video. Um, and so that's, you know, what we all grew up with. That was seventies and, and eighties, um, video game consoles and, and, and not just that, but you know, any, any kind of, any kind of video. Um, so some systems like say for example, the NES or the Atari 2600, they don't have anything better than that. Like, um, some systems, uh, have something that's a higher quality analog signal, which is called RGB. And what that basically is, is you take the entire like color spectrum, um, and what we can see are, are basically some combination of three primary colors, which is red, green, and blue. And so that, that basically makes up the entire wavelength spectrum that our eyes can process. And so, um, so some, you know, some devices and some video game systems from the from the 80s, they would have RGB video, and you could maybe broadcast that to some monitors, but usually you would pull composite or create composite from that and then send that to a TV. Um, so that's mainly for the 80s, like 70s stuff didn't have any of that capability or? Correct. Yeah. So, so yeah, 2600, 5200, 7800, those Atari systems didn't have that. Um, but but some did, like Sega Master System. Um, that has RGB. Um, but um, but yeah, in our world, in our like in North America, we really didn't have access to that. So so it was just, you know, composite you, was being generated from that. Do you do you know um so if I understand correctly, and I yeah. think I think this is correct. So the the system if a system can do RGB, it would generate that RGB like for itself, like inside. And then if you would get like a, like a RF or composite signal out, it would take that from its RGB signal. Yeah. Internally, some, okay. some, some, yeah, some systems work like that where the RGB is there, but not accessible. And you, the only thing that gets pulled out for the user to experience is RF or composite. Other systems like the master system, actually, you can pull it out. There are pins on the connector that that have RGB, and so as long as you have the right cable and the right monitor that understands RGB, then you can you can enjoy that. Now, so it depends. You get like a mix. Do you know if, like, did a company like Sega put in this RGB capability for a technical reason? Did they do it so maybe the end user had the ability to pull that? Like, do you know what yeah. made some companies do it do that and? And, and and why they didn't in other right. cases yeah so i think i think some of it was um some of it i think was for their own benefit because if for marketing purposes if you wanted to make the highest quality video capture or the highest quality still images for an advertisement of some kind whether it's a a commercial or a print ad or something like that then you want to use rgb because that's that was the gold standard that's the best quality analog that you can get um, so they've definitely used it for themselves, but some regions of the world um, had RGB monitors a little bit more um, readily available than, than we did. So in Japan, there was a standard called um, JP21 that, uh, that used to be around in the 80s and 90s. And so that would let you basically, it looks like a SCART cable, which is a, a Euro, another standard, a European standard, but basically you would plug in on one end your to your you know genesis or your super nintendo or your your master system and um on the other end you'd have this jp21 connector that would go into some televisions there and you'd get rgb um in europe too there was the scart standard which also uh lasted for quite a while so so some regions of the world benefited from this and we just didn't <laughs> unfortunately for us isn't isn't the uh i mean this is just a quick side note but isn't the european yeah. and the japanese scart like the same connector, but the pins are different, so you can screw your stuff up. 
by absolutely yeah i <laughs> yeah it's it's literally the same ca it's the same it's the same cable it's the same connector it's just how you wire the damn cable yeah that's e you. that's evil man because I you know, know. You, i remember i got uh when i bought my first frame meister and i yeah. kind of like heard that so i'm and I'm 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 scared to death because I just spent a couple hundred dollars on this thing. <laughs> the last thing I do waited forever for it to come from you know from overseas. Right. Um, yeah, that that that's that's low. I mean, I'm sure that nobody did it on purpose. But all right, so <laughs> yeah. so we, we have these systems. Uh, so like you said, so RF. Uh, so let's 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 go here. So let's just say I am a modern retro gamer. Yeah, it's not really a lie. Uh, and I have an old system. I have a Coleco, an Atari, a, uh, a Fairchild, or something. And RF's just not going to cut it for me. What what can be done, or what can I do, to get a better, uh, higher quality signal out of this thing? Because as I'm sure a lot of people listening to this podcast know, if you take an old RF signal, and if you plug it into, say, your modern TV, yeah. Uh, it's going to look like crap. It is. It is. And and if you haven't played those systems in a long time, it really messes with your head because you're going back into your memories from your childhood and you remember plugging this thing into your television. And, and that memory is going to look a hell of a lot better than whatever you see on your LCD television. Than the and, pile of crap that's on the screen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And you're going to question your memory because you're like, well, it looks like this. It couldn't have possibly looked better on a CRT. But guess what? It did. <laughs> um, it looked much better on a CRT. And it's just that the, the modern displays aren't equipped for these older types of signals. So RF is going to look like garbage. Most televisions that are sold nowadays don't even have composite video or even component. Or if you get that stuff, you've got to pay extra. It's pointless. Um, you know, HDMI is the standard. You know, that's it. And so, and so if you're getting back, just getting back into these things, thankfully, you know, we live in a very good time. Like five years ago, ten years ago, you kind of would have stuck with crap. Uh, nowadays, there are lots of choices for lots of different budgets. And so if it's something where you're like like you or I, like crazy, you want the absolute best of the best and you'll spend whatever you need to to get it, <laughs> then there's stuff for you. But then there's stuff for people who want to spend $10. Like I could take a 2600 and for heck, I mean less than $10, I could make it look a hell of a lot better. Um, so, well, let, so let's start with, let's just say I'm still using a CRT. Yeah, sure. I, obviously, there's a lot better. There's every type of uh, analog video signal is better than RF. So, yeah. <laughs> say I, I come with, I say, George, I have this 2600. I, I have a CRT. What, what can you do? How how can you help me? Yeah. So, if you've got just a CRT and I want and you want to put a 2600 on, um, say, composite video or even S video, there are some very cheap, inexpensive mods that you can do. So, you basically create a composite amplifier board and and for the 2600 it's simple it's like two resistors and a transistor it's like less than you know two dollars in parts and a circuit board that you can have manufactured and sent for you also for like a few dollars and um and then you basically just tap in where the rf was going to tap in and uh just drill some holes in the back of your system put your composite video jacks there and you're good to go it's actually a really nice beginner project because there's almost no soldering it's cheap it's technically reversible, and the quality of your the end result is like so much nicer. Um, what about audio? Yeah, so well with audio, yeah, so so you're gonna you're definitely gonna separate your your video and your audio, and so that's you know gonna be good, gonna keep those signals cleaner. But you know you're you're never gonna get anything more than what the system puts out. So and that's true in general with all of these mods. So it's like you're never gonna get some Dolby <laughs> five point one. Right, of course. But well, you'll get, but you can certainly get dual mono, so that you can at least get two speakers outputting the same thing. So if you if you put a, uh, say an S video or a composite off of a twenty six hundred, yeah, if, do you do a separate? Is there a separate, uh, like composite audio, that you hook in or? No, like, so so yeah, so if it's a mod like that, I think actually both treat audio the same way. So you just have mono sound that's isolated fully from the video, and you can make a choice whether to send it to one jack or two. And I usually pick two because otherwise, um, you know, your 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 television is going to have two speakers, so only one will be used right. otherwise. Um, yeah, so so 
but but then yeah, the circuit just gets more complex, more based on the video. So S video, there there are slightly more complicated mods, but that's also a big step up from composite and not too hard to do as well. Uh, are there any HDMI mods for the twenty six hundred? Mm, not directly. So the, the the highest quality for the twenty six hundred is is RGB. But uh, usually when people do RGB, um, the intention from there is to take it to a device like the OSSC, which is a line doubler, or to the FrameMeister, which is an upscaler. And so then the end result is that you get HDMI. And so you can have it, you know, you could have, you could have Atari 2600 in 4K <laughs> if you want. Right, right. Yeah, the, I mean, RGB is kind of like the highest you can go sometimes in running it through it's a thing to get HDMI out. Right, exactly. But then there are other systems which do do a pure digital HDMI. So, uh, for example, for the NES, there's there's a. Well, um, hold on, we're gonna get into the NES because right. that's one of the. Uh, <laughs> I, like, I know we're not gonna have time to dive into every system, but I just want to yeah. go to some of the big ones, um, at least like throughout the '70s and '80s. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. so we talked about um, Atari 2600. I'm assuming that like the. The 5200 and the 7800 are, are similar as far as what you can do with them, or is there They're any differences? Similar, yeah. So, so um, as of right now, the best you can do on the 7800 is S video. There actually is not an RGB mod yet, but um, but yeah, the 5200 you can certainly do RGB. Um, so so yeah. So but but even still, I mean, I've done S video on the 7800. That's like enormously uh, improved over over RF. So yeah, you can make them look a lot better. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, how about the Coleco and Intellivision? Yeah, so there actually are for those as well. Um, for the Coleco, it's actually really nice. There's this guy named uh, Dan Koontz uh, who, uh, re and for, for a long time, the access to getting an RGB mod for that was kind of very limited. Um, but this guy kind of developed his own circuit. He made it open source, and so as long as one has the skills to build the board you can buy all the parts and make it yourself so it's really really easy compared to a lot of these other options yeah that was for coleco i'm sorry for coleco yeah and television there's also one too i personally haven't done one of those yet but um from what i understand it's you know pretty straightforward and similar to some of these other ones too yeah and no hdmi for those right not yet no yeah not yet. i mean the de where there's more demand that's where a lot of these things come from. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's definitely, yeah, demand absolutely drives a lot of this stuff. But, I mean, what's really cool is that there are companies, small startup companies popping up or just hobbyists who um, are taking it upon themselves to make some of this stuff available. Um, so I know people are actually working on a 7800 RGB mod right now. So my guess is like another year or two. And this is something that's literally languished for like 20 years that people have been talking about it. And um, but But now... Neat. Yeah, it's great. That's yeah. This is a really great time to get into retro. All right, let's move on to uh, the the big boy. The, sure. The big the big beast. <laughs> I know if if you're if anyone's listening to this and they're kind of not familiar with this stuff, NES is probably one of the first thing. Like what? Whoa, whoa, whoa what can I do with my NES? Uh, yeah. I remember. I mean, NES was my first. You know, my first real love, and I I remember plugging my uh, NES in. Probably around 2007 ish uh, into a. It was either my actual NES or a clone system. I don't remember which one. But yeah. through composite into an LCD. And holy moly, it looked and played absolutely terrible. Uh, so, for anyone, uh, a quick refresher, and George, feel free to jump in if I'm missing any technical details here. Yeah, sure. If you use an old system that was made for a CRT television on a modern uh, television, depending on the modern television, a lot of times there is a lot of post-processing that goes on with the image. Yeah. Uh, so what that means is you will have lag in between your controller and the TV. So Mega Man, you, you'll, you'll suck at Mega Man a lot more than you thought you did because yeah, your, your jumps will be off and there's um, no beating Ninja Gaiden, there's no beating Punch-Out. Right, so, and <laughs> obviously that's not fun. No. So, I, I can I can fill in a little bit about why that lag happens, or sometimes what it is. So, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So the way the way that um, modern TVs deal with something like an NES is just completely wrong. Um, so so an NES outputs a 240 pixel resolution display, a 240p display, and 
a lot of TVs. I think there's a few exceptions, but most TVs get that signal and they understand it as 480 interlaced, which it's not. It's not even interlaced. It's progressive. And so, like you said, all that extra processing um, leads to some latency between your button press and when your characters move. And, and, and it varies a lot from TV to TV, but it can be really bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Sorry. It's bad. No, no, no. Not at all. Uh, so I know that there's a lot that can be done uh, with the NES, both for people who are still CRT purists and for people who just have their modern TV and the, they're like, I want this one thing. So let's start with uh, CRT havers. Yeah. Uh, what what can we do? So someone comes up to to George the Wizard and says, Mr. Wizard, <laughs> remember that show back on, uh, was it Nickelodeon back in the day? Uh, yeah. Mr. Wizard, uh, my NES looks like crap on my, you know, awesome 30-inch Sony Trinitron CRT TV. Right. Please help. Yeah, so, okay, so what you can do, uh, I think the, the thing that a lot of people do is they go with Tim Worthington's NES RGB mod. And um, before that, it was actually pretty terrible. Like, people would do horrible things in order to improve the the quality of their NES. So um, somebody a long time ago, I'm, I'm just going to give a little history here, just to, if it's okay. Absolutely. <laughs> so so uh, a long time ago, before there was any RGB anything for NES, somebody figured out that um, the Nintendo Play Choice, which was an arcade version of the Nintendo, um, had chips that were extraordinarily similar to uh, the ones that are found in a real Nintendo. So the, the graphics processor, which is called the PPU, uh, in the arcade are outputs RGB. And so someone figured out with a little bit of finagling, you could use that P that that PPU from an arcade machine in a Nintendo and get RGB. And so people were cannibalizing and destroying these like rare and amazing arcade machines just to get RGB on their Nintendos. And, and, and yeah, it looked great, but like at a really horrible cost in my opinion. And then finally this guy, Tim Worthington in Australia, he came up with um, this, this, board um, that basically uh, pulls data straight from the PPU and generates an RGB signal. Um, it also can give you component and I think it can give you S-Video as well. So you have a lot of different choices for a lot of different displays. It looks absolutely stunning and um, you can put it onto a CRT. Um, you can do it a couple of different ways. You can use uh, component cables if it's a regular American CRT or if you have something like a PVM, like a professional broadcast monitor, which a lot of retro gamers are into, you can connect it directly up to that, and it looks absolutely amazing. Uh, I used to have one, and I can say uh, it does look amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. It uh, yeah. really, I mean, the S video. I uh, I used to have a PVM, and I hooked up. I don't remember if I think it was my SNES, but um, I might have done my NES too. I hooked it up with both S video and. Uh, RGB, yeah, and it was just an input on the TV, so I would compare the signal because right. I'm like, how much? And I was you really just toggle between, right? And I was really surprised to see that, like S video, at least in this specific case. I'm not saying this is a blanket statement by any means. The S video was like 90 percent of what the RGB was. Like it was very hard to tell to a difference. difference, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, this is just my opinion here, but. If anyone is looking to get like super, you know, good quality out of their stuff and they have a CRT, like getting a CRT with S video is a lot easier than getting a, like a Sony professional video monitor. Uh, yeah. And it's a lot cheaper. It's probably, you know, hundreds of dollars cheaper. And you could probably get most of, in my opinion, yeah, uh, most of what you're looking for in S video. Uh, you know, at a, at a way lower price. So I completely agree. And and uh, not only that, nowadays, if you want to go for S video, and you want to use a you know modern television, you can even do that too. Because um, there's a device called the RetroTink, which is outstanding, uh, made by this guy named Mike Chi, and uh, it line doubles S video input and and generates an HDMI. 480p signal that any television, any modern TV can can understand, and it looks awesome. It looks so good, and it's a hundred bucks. It's not that bad. Um, is that like the Framemeister? Is that does that do kind of what that does? 
No, it's more similar to the it's it's a line doubler, so it's more like a, an OSSC. So there's I don't think there's any any latency of any kind. Um, it takes in composite video, it takes in uh, S video, and I can't remember maybe one or two other things. But it's but like higher end vid, like RGB and component that's that's the OSSC. But but the but the the RetroTINK can still do quite a lot, and um, yeah, so that's that's a great choice as well. Huh, I never really knew about that, so I'm going to yeah. ask you more about that in the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, so for anyone who doesn't know or remember, the original NES came with an RF output and the and the uh, composite on the side, which I think a lot of people kind of forgot about, maybe because yeah, it was on the side. Yeah. Uh, so if you have your NES and you just want to, you have a, an older CRT and you're using RF, just use the use the AV cables because it's right there. Yeah, that's uh, a big jump. And then the next, I guess, the next step is using the uh, Tim Worthington's board, which will give you the S video on the RGB. Uh, so what if I have my beautiful billion inch LCD TV? What can <laughs> I what can I do with the NES then? Yeah. So in, and this is what I did for my personal one is is uh, the uh, the um, uh, what's it called the NES. Uh, I'm sorry. The high def NES uh, is is a board that was recently created that that gives you a pure digital to digital uh, signal from from your Nintendo. So so basically, what that does is it's a bit more of a complicated mod. You have to remove more chips basically, but it taps directly into the CPU and into the PPU, and it gives you a pure digital signal. So in theory, it's even cleaner than RGB because with RGB, you're, you're still taking something digital and turning it into something analog. And so in principle, there's always going to be some kind of noise that gets introduced, some sort of signal dropout, something. I mean, in reality, I've toggled between an NES RGB and the high def NES, and I can't personally see any difference. But theoretically, the high def NES should give you a perfect signal. Um, and so that also gives you tons of options, not just with video, but with sound as well. So um, the NES is, you probably know, but maybe some of the listeners don't, um, has a kind of interesting history when it comes to audio. So so Nintendo's in the United States, um, they, they, you know, they had basically the audio that it came with. Um, but with the Japanese uh, NES, the Famicom, um, it had access to... Um, two digital uh, sound channels and two additional ones. So so like the NES and the Famicom, they both come stock with like four sound channels. But with Famicom, you can get two additional sound channels. And with this particular mod, you can basically take your American NES and give it the same functionality as its Japanese counterpart. And you can independently adjust the audio levels for every channel and really like wow. dial it in exactly the way you want. Yeah, it's so cool. It's really cool. So if you if you take uh, Japanese games and run them on your American system with one of those converter carts, uh, it'll play exactly the way it's supposed to, and it'll uh, sound great. Dude, I'm just pulling this out of my uh, my memory here, but Castlevania three. That's has... one of them. Yeah. Yeah, Castlevania three is one of the best examples. If you hear the Japanese Castlevania three, you will realize just how badly we got screwed over here. <laughs> it just sounds so good compared to the American version. Yeah. Mr. Gimmick two, right? I think Mr. That was yeah, that. Mr. Gimmick never even came here, but it has uh, it had that extra those extra channels. It has those extra channels too, and that's an unbelievably good game. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and I can George uh, did so he modified my NES. I I had two NESs as a kid. I had my original uh, front loader, and that met a uh, a sad end. And <laughs> I'll tell that story real quick. So, sure. it was two thousand. I don't know eight. I didn't know that these systems could be repaired. So I had my old NES that had not worked in a very long time. I tried to replace the pin connector, didn't really, wasn't really doing. So I said, I'm going to upgrade this for the modern age. And I completely killed the entire thing. I put a, I put a, an ITX computer in it and I made it into an emulator box. Oh my uh, God. <laughs> but like, I was like, you know, cutting apart the case and, Da, 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 da. tearing it to shreds tearing it to shreds <laughs> and uh and then once i <laughs> once i realized i could have fixed it i was like oh like man i i wish but can't live your life with regrets but no. uh so i got that in 87 but around 90 91 whenever the top loader came out i got that As when well. it came out so i yeah. still had that and george was nice enough to install the high def hdmi mod onto that for me 
and it is amazing. So yeah. if anyone like is thinking about it, you're on the fence. I know it can be a little pricey, but I it's, mean, it's it's, it's top tier. It's so worth it. If you're a huge fan of the NES, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's the way to go by far. It just gives you so many options and, and just makes the whole experience really enjoyable. Yeah. So let's move on to, um, well, I wanted to go on to some Sega stuff, but yeah, if we're talking about the 80s, let's talk about the Turbo Graphics. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, and end of the 80s. I I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that it only came with RF and you had to get like a, a, a adapter piece to yeah. give it. To give it composite video. It was such a, it's like a scammy kind of thing with the, I mean, I love the Turbo Graphics as well. I, I never owned one, but I had a really close friend when I was a kid growing up. So I played it a lot. But I hated the fact that we needed the turbo tap for two players, like really, like that, and and, and getting the accessory for composite video, yeah, the it's the booster, yeah, right, right. So, so yeah, they kind of made even that basic feature something you had to pay extra for, yeah. So what what modifications are you able to do? Let's start with analog. I don't even know if there is a digital, but let's let's stay analog. Yeah. Uh, what what can you do? Yeah, so so thankfully there is a way to get RGB out of um, the Turbo Graphics, and uh, it's not that bad um, compared to some of the other ones. I mean, developing it I think was difficult. Like getting clean RGB out of a Turbo Graphics I think is a very challenging thing. Um, but uh, thankfully, you know, this is something that's been going on for a long time, and if you look at the modern solutions, they're they're top notch. Um, and so, so yeah. In that respect, it's just a simple matter of, of adding a um, adding a uh, you know a, a board to it, and uh, and then and then just either creating an extra you know port for it, or um, some people I think have also tapped into some lines where the turbo booster comes in, but that's not something I've ever personally tried. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that there's anything else like S video or uh, component that I'm aware of, but, but the RGB on the turbo graphics, as long as it's done right, it looks like so, so good as well. Um, and there's, there's a couple of things too, like there's, you know, as you know, there's not just the turbo graphics, but there was also the turbo duo, which came out later, which combined the CD unit with the, um, with the actual turbo graphics. And, right. and, um, what's nice about that is that you can basically just hijack the original port, which gave you composite video and you can output your RGB straight there. So from the outside, it just looks like a normal system, but then on the inside, it's got all that awesomeness. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sega. Now I remember back when I had my PVM and I started to get into some of the stuff. I was yeah. very, uh, it was very nice that all the Sega stuff came with native RGB. You could just yeah, plug really in great. the right cable and there you go. Yeah. Uh, the not nice thing is that a lot of the capacitors uh, over the years and a lot of the systems needed recapping. Yeah. Uh, now, is that because, did they use uh, like cheaper parts than say Nintendo did? Because a lot of the SNESs and NESs are still working fine. Is Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question. I. I... I, it's hard for because yeah you're totally spot on about this like I can't tell you how many Sega products I have fixed over like just this year alone I can tell you I've fixed about 50 game gears just game gears um, and it's always always capacitors um, and I, I think in some cases maybe it was cheaping out I think I think like actually the the master system is rock solid I I don't usually see bad capacitors on there um genesis is kind of hit or miss like the earlier ones are not so great nowadays the later ones tend to be fine but game gear in particular is just dreadful like they use really bad capacitors but in that case i don't think it was actually about being cheap i think it was about them not realizing like they, they bought components thinking that they were rated a certain way and and they weren't um and you can kind of tell this because uh I've I've fixed more Game Gears literally than any other system out there, like more than maybe about 150 total so far. <laughs> and um, I, when you get to the ones that were manufactured towards the end of the production life, those still work. Like those still have good capacitors. So somehow towards the end of the manufacturing, they realize like, we screwed up, and and they bought different kinds of caps. And and those I'll change their caps anyway, but they still work. Um, so I think in that case it was a genuine mistake. Um, but yeah, so it was probably a mix of the two, to be honest. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, 
also, I know that the uh, this is something I kind of went into the rabbit hole a couple years ago about. Yeah. The, the Genesis had so many different hardware revisions. They did. Uh, because I'm a I'm an armchair audio nerd, so <laughs> I wanted you know the best the best audio. Uh, quick side note to anyone who's listening: if you never really put your your retro systems through like a good pair of headphones or a good set of speakers. Uh, you definitely should. I, when I got my S- SNES modded uh, originally years ago, the guy who did it added a uh, a headphone jack to the back, mm. right? So I had these little Bose computer speakers. They're they're pretty high quality. They give out a good sound, and I plugged it in. And I started playing Aladdin for SNES. Now I played Aladdin a billion times over the past <laughs> you know what twenty something years. Yeah. And as I was playing, I heard sounds I've never heard before, and I. At one point, the when you're in the Cave of Wonders and the big boulder comes down, it goes... Doo, 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 yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. And it made a sound, and I and I, I started going like this. I said, <laughs> I said, what what the hell was that? Yeah. I, I, it blew my mind, and then I really started paying more attention. And, uh, and yeah, so the audio uh, that these can put out, I think a lot of the times we do it a disservice by not... by just having it go through, like, an old CRT TV speaker, and there's... There, there's yeah. a there's a lot of meat on the bone there, so there really is. I played SNES on a mono CRT growing up, and so just going to stereo was unreal. I was just like, wow, this sounds so much better. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but yeah, you're you're totally right about Genesis. Like there were a ton of hardware revisions, and they made all sorts of interesting choices about um, about sound. And and the best ones, I would argue, are the earliest models. So so. They used a different FM synthesizer. I think it's the Yamaha YM3812, if I remember correctly. And it it just sounds like really good. Like your your quintessential Genesis, like Streets of Rage 2 or something like that. Like like that's what that's what I think about with that FM synth chip. It just sounds so right. much better. At the, yeah, I think there were two and like I said, this is a couple of years ago, so I could be wrong, but I think yeah. there were two revisions of like the Model One Genesis that were kind of regarded as like get one of these if you can. Right. Um, and then there was a whole bunch of others. Uh, and I'm not even going to include the Genesis Model 3, which was, it's just a piece of garbage. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and it, no, I'm sorry, go kept, ahead. It just kept going downhill. Yes. And it was, yeah, and, and the, the FM synth chip thing, I think, was definitely about saving cost. And they, they switched to a different Yamaha um, synth chip. And, um, yeah, and it just isn't simply isn't as good. It's not amplified well enough. Um and you know what, what I mean? And, and yeah, when you go to the Model 3 by Majesco, forget it. That thing is just like, yeah, yeah hot that's, garbage. We're not, we're not even going to talk about <laughs> that garbo. Yes. Uh, so, all right. So let's just say I have a Genesis. We're not really going to get into the uh, into the, the different versions because we'll be here all night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but so like I, I can say, because I had one, I know that you can add an S-Video port yep. to a Genesis, which is nice. Yep. Um can you add an like a separate audio out on the back? Yeah, you can. You can you can you can add separate audio on the back. There's a lot of audio mods for the Genesis nowadays. Um, and and people have actually been there's this there's this um, effort to really characterize it's, I, for, I forgot the name of the group. I think it's MD Fourier where they're trying to you know, categorize each revision of the Genesis to get its use, unique sound signature and understand how they're all different. But but um, if one wants to get the best possible video and audio from a Genesis, it's no longer such a difficult thing. Like you don't have to go hunting for like that specific Genesis anymore. Um, you can get something called a triple bypass board, and and it basically bypasses the uh, the audio circuit completely, and um, it also bypasses the RGB uh, encoder on on the board, and so it gives you high quality RGB and the highest quality sound identical to those early model Genesis. So it'll sound and look no different from one of those like model one, like best quality Genesis. So are you essentially replacing the audio chip then? Yeah, you're, I I think you, I don't exactly know what it's tapping in at some point. And then I think it's maybe the amplification process. I'm not retranslating it somehow or something like that. I don't know the, the technical details, but I know that the end result is that you can even take a Model 3, which is junk, and make it look and sound like a Model 1. <laughs> wow. 
And in yeah. case anyone has not gotten this from us yet, that Model 3 is big Garbo <laughs> yeah. with a capital Arbo. Uh, yes. <laughs> so here's a question. So let's just say I uh, I added a an audio out to the back. Yeah. What is that different from the normal headphone out that's on the front? It, well, no, it's going to end up being the same. So, like, I, I guess it depends on the system you're talking about. So, so if, if you're talking about a Model 1, then it's basically going to be the same as that headphone jack. And so that's really nice because on a Model 1, if you don't use that jack, you're stuck getting mono sound, which just generally sucks. Right. Um, so so having it in the back is just a convenient way of, of connecting it up to your system, to your, you know, your retro setup, whether it's to a switch, or, switch box or straight into your television. Wait, does, do, do they output... Mono, do they all output mono uh, natively? So the yeah, so the the um, all of them output mono natively. The Model One, its jack um, for for audio and video, the composite jack, uh, that only outputs mono. It does not output stereo. So the only way to get stereo out of a Model One is to go to that headphone jack. Gotcha. So huh. the mod that you did does away with all of that and then just has some nice stereo output on the back. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, what 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 other stuff can you do with the Genesis? Hmm. What other stuff? Geez, there's there's quite a lot. Um, there's there's interesting stuff with the uh, the Nomad that you can do. Um, so that's another system I really enjoy. So um, with the Nomad, um, it has a passive matrix screen similar to the Game Gear, which you know doesn't look that great now, um, and they're prone to failing and you know, it's just generally, and it also consumes batteries like no tomorrow. Yeah. So you you can replace that with a modern uh, TFT composite screen, an LCD screen, which like really improves the quality and significantly reduces the battery consumption. That's really nice. Um, if you uh, if you want, you can also add in functionality to some of these systems for for other like like um sorry I'm getting ahead of myself like uh, the Model Three for example uh, aside from all the other reasons it's garbage it doesn't work with a 32x so you can you can modify that to give it the functionality of of the other systems where it can use a 32x i think you can even make it connect up to a sega cd which is insane but it can be done um and uh and and that's also true in indirectly for the nomad so the nomad can't understand what a sega cd is telling it because it has no way to even connect to one um, but nowadays there are devices that can mimic a Sega CD and go straight into the cartridge slot, and um, and if you uh, wire it up correctly, it can understand the the video and audio as though it's connected to a Sega CD, and you can play Sega CD games on the go. <laughs> That's amazing. So, the Nomad needs modification to be able to do that. Uh, some minor modification. The, the video part actually it can handle. It's the it's the sound that it doesn't understand, like the CD audio. It doesn't know how to. It, it doesn't have the circuitry built in. So you just have to kind of recreate that, and then it will, it will. Uh, All right, I understand. may I may uh, ask you for help with my note. <laughs> I, I can do that. <laughs> uh, so we're talking about these systems from the '70s and the '80s. I know we've said things like the uh, the. A lot of the Sega stuff had uh, was prone to cap failure, stuff like that. But as far as reliability goes, do you have like in your head, because mm-hmm. you've worked with so many of these, are there yeah. some systems from these these eras that kind of stand out as absolutely rock solid? Some yeah, that, yeah. So I'd say the most bulletproof systems are are the N sixty four, by far. I don't think I've fixed more than 10 of them. Like, I'm not even kidding. And, and this year, I'm on track to go over 400 repairs this year. And and I haven't fixed a single one. I haven't needed to. They, they don't break. They're just so well engineered. Um, the NES is also pretty good, too, because, yeah, things happen, but they're almost always fixable. Like, they're really, they're almost always something minor. It's a great system to get into if you want to learn how to repair things, because when they do have problems, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the 2600 is another great example too. It's it's um, you know, very simple, very simple diagram, very simple circuit, um, and and you can have hilariously like 40 year old capacitors on a 2600 that perform better than a PS3, <laughs> and I think that's just really funny. Yeah. Um, but true. <laughs> so I don't know. Those are those are three systems in particular that I can think of that like, they don't break often, and when they do, they're usually really easy to get going again. What, yeah. what about on the other end? What about the the horror the, the, shows? The horror, yeah, the horror shows. Okay, so um, 
Okay, so the horror show. So unfortunately, NEC, you know, the company for for Turbo Graphics, um, a, a lot of their stuff is bad. Um, so the the Turbo Duo and the Turbo Express in particular. The Turbo Express is basically a portable Turbo Graphics 16, and those never work ever. They always have problems, um, and they're extremely delicate, really hard to work on. Um, the Turbo Duo is also bad, and it's, again, it's about capacitors, and it's also because they have something like 60 capacitors on there. So you, you're going to be sitting there for hours taking them all off, and usually they damage something. So then you got to go and repair the damage that they did. So th those are bad. Um, what else is bad? Uh, I already spoke about the Game Gear. That's also bad. They never, almost never work. It's pr pretty, pretty rare. Um, interestingly, and you might not know this, but like early like launch Super Nintendos are not so great. Um, and and it's not because of the system itself. It's actually about the revision of the CPU and the and the PPU, the picture processing units. So. Um, Nintendo, I don't know if they ever documented it properly, but there's some kind of fault in those CPUs, and they just die. Like they just simply die. Like you'll you'll be playing it one day, and then you'll just turn it on, just black screen, and uh, there's nothing you can do because that's a proprietary part. The only way you can fix that is by sa salvaging it from another system. You know, so. it's it's funny you say that. When I was uh, when I got my SNES at launch, yeah, I got it from uh, Woolworths. I remember that, yeah. and I brought it home, plugged it in, and it either didn't work right away or it worked for a, like an hour and then just shut off. So wow. that, that's probably what happened. And that's we, exactly what yeah, happened. I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah, there was a, it was a design flaw. Eventually they fixed it. Right, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. All right, I, um, I do want to talk more about mods and stuff, but I think that that's a good place to end it because sure. uh, there's a lot more material. So uh, I, I can't thank you enough for coming yeah. on and uh, talking about this stuff. I know that... I feel like I'm a somewhat educated guy and you've taught me a lot, you know, just from this Thanks. discussion. <laughs> so, uh, I'll have you back soon. Uh, and, any closing uh, words for the, for the audience? Um, yeah. I mean, the only thing I would say is just don't be afraid to, to experiment and to tinker. Like, you know, if I had been afraid, then I wouldn't have done any of the stuff I talked about today. And it's not like I was trained in electrical engineering or anything like that. You know, I taught myself and, and, uh, Start with small projects and work your way up, and you can do a lot of cool stuff. Right. You just went to wizard school, then you started modifying <laughs> systems. <Right>. Uh, <laughs> if anyone does want to have an interest in jumping into modding their uh, your own systems, George does have a series on the Long Island Retro Gaming YouTube channel called Fix It Friday, uh, which he every week he uploads a video. He kind of walks you through what's going on. So those are excellent educational resources. Uh, he also posts... Uh, still images in a story every Friday on the Long Island Retro Gaming uh, social media channels, the Facebook and the uh, Instagram. And he also posts them in our two local Long Island Facebook enthusiast groups, which is Long Island Gamers United and Game Over Long Island. So you can find his stuff all over there. You can also <laughs> see him uh, at the Long Island Retro Gaming Expo. He has the repair table and... Uh, more details to be announced, but we're talking about uh, hopefully doing something where you can bring your stuff for him to fix during the convention, and uh, we're going to tie it into a charity, so uh, we're going to help kids and get some old stuff working again, which can't get better than that, right? Yeah, definitely. All right, George. Well, thanks again. All right, thanks. Uh, we'll talk to you soon, and we will catch you next time, guys. All right. Take care. Bye.